Hi, this is a quote from Charles Dickens. Uh, Mrs. Jellybee was looking far away into Africa. Do people remember the character of Mrs. Jellybee? Yeah, so yeah, she's very memorable. If you've, if you've read Bleak House, which was written in, I believe, the 1850s. The thing about Mrs. Jellybee is Mrs. Jellybee was very concerned about what was going on in Africa. And this seems to Charles Dickens to be rather ridiculous. It, I think it's interesting to, to put it in context. So when Bleak House was written, actually a couple of decades before Bleak House was written, we have some data on um, uh, average incomes across the world. And at the time, so actually I'm going back to now 1820, 1825, the Brit British national income per person was three times the national income in places such as China and India. And it was four times the national income uh, per head of the poorest places in the world, which sounds like a big gap. When I reflect on the latest data, at the moment, um, national income of the richest, you know, most, uh, the richest economy in the world, the United States, it's, it's not three times the national income per person in China, it's five times. It's not three times the national income per person in India, it's ten times. And it's not four times the, the income per person of the poorest countries. It's 40 or 50 times richer per person than the poorest countries. So Charles Dickens was writing in a world where, oh, for sure, rich countries were richer than poor countries, but they weren't, they weren't that much richer. They weren't unimaginably richer. Rich countries now are unimaginably richer. Who's this? No, it's Elizabeth Bennet. <laughs> It's Elizabeth Bennet from Pride and Prejudice. Okay, it's Keira Knightley as well. Um, <laughs> Keira Knightley playing the role of Elizabeth Bennet. And uh, one more slide. Who's this? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Mr. Darcy. Yes. So, uh, yes, I know they are actually different adaptations of Pride and Prejudice. Um, so Jane Austen set Pride and Prejudice um, a few decades before Bleak House. So th this is the early 19th century. And you may remember the, the, one of the key ideas in Pride and Prejudice is Eliz Elizabeth Bennet's fortunes depend on whom and if she marries. And if she marries Mr. Darcy, uh, he has nothing going for him apart from his money, obviously, as you can see. Um, <laughs> so if she marries Mr. Darcy, Mr. Darcy's income is £10,000 a year. Now that puts Mr. Darcy, firm, Mr. Darcy firmly in the top 0.1%. You know, out of every thousand people, 999 of them are poorer than Mr. Darcy. Now, uh, Mr. Darcy, by, so uh, Elizabeth Bennet would get half of that, 5,000 pounds. Her current share of her family's income is closer to 400 pounds a year. And actually, if her father dies, and through various complicated means I don't need to uh, bore you with, she will end up on about £40 a year. Now, £40 a year, by the way, still twice the average wage in the UK at the time. So she's not going to starve. But £40 a year, I think we can all agree, a lot less than £5,000 a year. So basically, if she marries Mr. Darcy versus if she doesn't marry anybody, the gap in income that Elizabeth Bennet faces is, is around 100 times. Now, Branko Milanovic, uh, who, as I say, is an expert on inequality, has taken those numbers and translated them into modern terms, into 21st century terms. So we say, well, how much money does a modern Mr. Darcy have, somebody who's in the top 0.1% in the UK income distribution? And how much money would, would Elizabeth Bennet be forced to fall back on if she went down to just twice the average income? And the gap between those two is actually a lot narrower than it was 200 years ago. It's a factor of about 17. So previously, marry Mr. Darcy or don't marry Mr. Darcy, that, made, that put two extra zeros on Elizabeth Bennet's income. A modern Elizabeth Bennet, well, a modern Elizabeth Bennet would get her, get her own job and so on, but okay, a modern Elizabeth Bennet forced to rely on marrying Mr. Darcy or not, it makes a much smaller difference. Still a big difference, 
Still a 17-fold difference between the top 0.1% and the merely comfortably off, but it's a much smaller difference. So, through this study of 19th century literature, what, what have we learned? Well, back in the 19th century, rich countries were richer than poor countries, but they weren't that much richer. And back in the 19th century, rich individuals within a society were richer than poorer individuals within a society. Not just dramatically richer, but dramatically richer relative to the gap today. So the gap between countries has grown over the last 200, 150 years. The gap within countries has shrunk. So this is a chart of global inequality. And this is measured according to the Gini coefficient, which is a very common measurement of inequality. And it's inequality of incomes. So what do we learn looking at this chart? Well, global inequality was very high in 1870, and it was very high in 2000. I mean, these are, this is higher than any individual country. This is higher than a country such as Brazil, higher than a country such as Russia or South Africa. Global levels of inequality are enormously high, and they've been enormously high for a very, very long time. Um, but what's interesting is that I, I call to mind now, again, the seven billion people lined up from the, the poorest to the richest. And remember, to get into that top 1%, you need 25,000 pounds a year after tax per, per person. What is it that determines who's at the top and who's at the bottom? What is it that it determines this, these levels of inequality? What we see is the pink is inequality due to location. Where in the world you live, or more precisely, which country you live in. And then the, the darker pink or red, that's what we might loosely call class. Uh, I mean, nobody believes in class anymore, in a classless society, but basically, where on the income distribution you are within a society. So the pink is this sort of question of were you born in Uganda or Angola, or were you born in Switzerland or Norway? Um, and, and the red is, do you get to marry Mr. Darcy, or are you going to have to make it on your own? And what we see is the same thing that we've learned through our study of 19th century literature, which is that used to be the action, was, there was inequality in both, but the action was all driven by where you were within a particular society. Were you, were you one of the richest people inside your own society? That was true in the 19th century. Today, it's much more a case of, well, don't tell me whether you're you know, one of the richest people in your society or one of the poorest people in your society. Tell me which society you live in. Tell me which country you're a citizen of. That is the thing, overwhelmingly, that determines whether you're going to get into that top 1%. You're going to be one of the 1% richest people on the planet. It's not that hard if you already live in Switzerland. You're halfway there. It's extremely hard if you live in Pakistan or Bangladesh. Maybe it was reasonable for Charles Dickens to mock Mrs. Jellyby in 1850. I'm not sure it was quite fair even then. Given what we now know about what's driving inequality in the modern world, it now seems absurd to mock somebody for a concern about what's happening in Africa, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan. And this is as far as economic inequality is concerned, this is where the action's really happening. Of course, there is still inequality within countries. In some countries, there's very grave inequality, but it's dwarfed by the inequality between countries. And that is something that has changed since Charles Dickens wrote. But you can see what he's getting at. What he's getting at is, not only did he feel that Mrs. Jellyby was looking at the wrong problem, but Charles Dickens felt that Mrs. Jellyby didn't understand the problem she was trying to solve, and that her efforts to improve the plight of people in Africa were misguided, they weren't working. Now that is a criticism that has more force.